I'm in a place that big tech companies would rather didn't exist. It's a Sunday evening and this market in North Delhi is buzzing. Last year, 1.39 billion mobile phones were sold globally. And over 5 billion mobiles were estimated to be thrown away. But right here could be a solution for much of this waste. I'm in a North Indian market and there's really nothing you can't get here. We don't really see places like this anymore where people are just using whatever they have around them to fix what's broken. Because changes in the way products are made is changing this market and others like it. Well, iPhone 4 was 5, 6, 7, 8, 10, 11. And because people are choosing to buy new rather than repair, e-waste now makes up the majority of our overall toxic waste. And it's happening all over the world. So many people are now working to bring this repair mindset back. India wants to retain this ingenuity and the culture of fixing what's broken while also keeping its economy strong. I'm here in Delhi, the repair capital, to figure out how all of this is going to play out. I've had my phone for four and a half years now, which is a relatively very long time to own a smartphone. I'm in a challenge with myself to see how much longer I can make it last. But I've also been very careless and completely ruined my display. But I looked it up and it cost 30,000 rupees to buy a new phone of the same model. So I'm here to see whether it's worth getting it repaired instead. Uh, I'm just not sure whether it's worth paying a third rather than getting a new phone with a new battery and, a, and more memory. The showroom quoted 16,000 rupees, which is more than half the price of the phone, so I'm not going there. I'm going to get a few more quotes from a different place. This is an informal and semi-formal electronics okay, market. Guys. This is a grey area. Some vendors may be authorised dealers, others may not be registered. And not all of them pay taxes. They told me they can offer cheaper services by cutting deals over or under the table or find some workaround or the other. Original SKM, 7,000. And this copy, I mean, with copy screen, is there a guarantee with copy screen? No, it's original with guarantee. It won't come. It's quite interesting that everybody has quoted me a different figure, which means that, of course, there's no standard and you have to haggle and you have to find the best price, which does take a lot of time. And I still want to think about it more. India has a long history of repairing over replacing. Most street corners once had a cobbler or a tailor who fixed saris that stayed in families for many generations. But it gets more niche. This tradesman specializes in only fixing zips. The economic boom of the 1990s and 2000s changed this culture completely. With more money in their pockets and things getting cheaper, people started buying more. And something else happened. India went ultra-digital. Every kind of payment is now done online, from rickshaws to coconut water. Having a phone is now basically mandatory. Phones in India are so cheap and accessible that there are more people with phones than beds or mattresses or chairs. Electronic devices though became an outlier to the old Indian repair culture, mainly because electronics companies don't allow for repair. Gadgets have been accused of being designed for the dump. It's called planned obsolescence. And companies have been taken to court over it. For example, this year, Apple is preparing to pay up to $500 million in the US in settlements in a case accusing them of slowing down older iPhones. The Italian government fined Samsung 5 million euros in a similar case that found that updates slowed down devices. As a result of all this, e-waste has grown phenomenally in India and many countries have had similar results in their stories of development and affluence. Very little of this waste is formally recycled. This is where electronics come to die. This is the biggest electronics waste market in the country. Truck loads of discarded electronics come here every day and are dumped onto local traders. These people separate them and sell parts on to recyclers or other kinds of scrap dealers. There's literally e-waste everywhere. Look at that. Here, traders break down the tech to recover anything of value. 
The results of this kind of informal dumping are made obvious by what's meant to be a storm drain. But there's no space for water to flow. We saw a lot of people, including and especially children, collecting anything of value. And this scavenging comes at a high price. The lead, cadmium or beryllium in e-waste has been known to cause skin conditions in the first instance, but it's also been linked to problems with the liver and development of the brain, including in newborns. It was very hard to film here and nobody really wanted to talk to me on camera. I met Satish Sinha, a researcher of chemical pollution, to ask what needs to happen to stop this. So both on the production side or on consumption side, you'll have to make a lot of adjustments. On the production side, I can say that how do you design products better? Suppose you can design a product which is modular in nature, because today we are, we are dis you're discarding a product because you cannot take it to the next level. Second thing is about lowering consumption is also because if you design products, because if it lasts with me for longer time, I am not likely to discard it. So my waste uh, generation becomes, reduces. Yeah. Third thing is about, we need to formalize repairs. We need to formalize refurbishments. And by law also they are permitted. Mm -hmm. It's only that, how do we encourage this? I think that we have not been able to break through. This third thing is something the government is starting to work on. It launched a portal in 2023 to ensure its citizens have the right to repair. Around 50 companies have signed up so far on paper. These include manufacturers of farm equipment, consumer durables and automobiles, as well as electronics. I met the man in charge, Rohit Kumar Singh, the highest ranking administrative officer at the Ministry of Consumer Affairs, who went over the main points. In case the product requires repair or a routine maintenance, it shouldn't be expensive, it should be easily accessible and uh, it should be you know, readily available in the ecosystem of the consumer. So we put all that together and we uh, are doing the right to repair uh, framework. More specifically, this would include access to information on how to repair, providing cheap and original spare parts to consumers and third parties. And it also includes more specific calls to action, like that all chargers must be USB-C by June 2025. We don't want to become an impediment in the ease of doing business also. Right. You know, it's a, it's a very tricky thing. Yeah. So on the one hand, you want more business in India, you want economy to grow, yeah. you want more FDI. Yeah. So you want to make things simple and streamlined, yeah. but you also have to protect the consumer, right. protect the planet, yeah. and these things can be competing. Right now, there's one main problem. This framework is voluntary. It hasn't been tabled or passed as a bill in parliament. And that... Yes. It can be a long process. This is Zongwe Dunia, a professor of law at Alliance University in Bangalore, who has looked into where India is at with the right to repair. But it's possible that the parliament also won't pass it, right? Yeah, it's possible. It's possible because uh, remember that um, we are talking about also the interest of, um, um, let's say, producer groups that are quite powerful. Uh, in uh, India, there was a case that was decided um, in the mid 2010s, the Kataria case. In this case, a lawyer named Shamshed Kataria took 14 car manufacturers to court, which only allowed for repairs in exclusive repair shops. He argued that these manufacturers monopolized the spare parts market and were abusing this dominance, sometimes marking up the price of spare parts 5,000%. The manufacturers fought back. And the argument was that, well, but if we allow, let's say, if we give certain tools, to consumers or if you allow many more people to repair those cars or those consumer goods we go it's going to infringe our intellectual property rights in that case the court decided against them mandating that they allow consumers to go wherever they choose based on what they can access and afford the problem that if you have a if you have markets where uh, intellectual property uh, are not respected you may discourage investment uh, into that industry. For example, the firms uh, that uh, produce those um, electronic goods may be dis dis um, may have a disincentive to enter the market. They may actually leave the market because they will say, well, but then we, we, we are losing the incentive to innovate because our intellectual property right is not protected because of the right to repair. 
There has already been pushback, even against the simple USB-C charger rule. Apple in India has asked for an exemption or a delay, saying it would otherwise struggle to meet production targets. But there are economic arguments for repair too. At the moment, most of the material that goes into making electronics remains unaccounted for. These include important resources like lithium, which we will need a lot more of in the future. So these are of huge national value. Many countries are pushing ahead on this. In early 2024, the European Parliament took a leap forward and voted strongly in favour of strengthening the right to repair in all 27 countries of the EU. Some are even handing out repair vouchers paid for by national repair funds. France has set up what might become a norm across many products, a repairability index, much like the one that shows you the energy efficiency of, say, a refrigerator, to give the consumer more agency. The US is not far behind, and such decisions will have impacts on countries like India and beyond. Some of the products, they have these global supply chains, yeah. so they manufacture for the world. So the world has to be on the same page, which is a difficult task to achieve. Yeah. But then we also engage with EU, and uh, they are doing from a specific date, they are making it mandatory. Mm -hmm. So we said, okay, uh, EU plus six months. There's estimated to be a $20 billion domestic market for repair and a $5 billion domestic market for refurbishment in India. So startups are jumping in by setting up repair and refurbishment units. CTDI in Bangalore and Gadgetwood in Noida are examples, both with huge foreign investments. It's a win-win-win proposition for the consumer, for the guy who's working as, uh, and gets an employment, and the company. It expands their repair network. The consumer gets benefit because it's cheaper and it's accessible and the guy is being able to make a living. But this all still exists in pockets in very early stages. The big challenge is the hundreds of thousands of people whose livelihood depends on repair. Formalizing such a massive informal economy, developing skills, registering and ensuring they pay tax is not going to be an easy task, even if the government says the intention is there. It's also going to be a challenge to keep accounts of all these resources, but that is the hope. I think I've decided not to change the display of my phone because it's about a third of the cost of buying a new phone itself, which is just too expensive, especially considering I don't have a guarantee that the new display will last for a long enough time to make the investment worth it. So I think I'm just going to wait for my phone to die and buy a new one. But if and when the right to repair does come into play, my decision might be quite different. Developing countries like India have a unique opportunity to still tap into their cultures of reuse and repair and retain them for a more sustainable and equitable future. The right to repair is a growing discussion around the world that is likely to have huge implications. Let us know your take on it and don't forget to come back for more videos like this every Friday.